Uh, thank you for listening to our third webinar of the 2023 CKF webinar series. This webinar will focus on finances and transplant. Um, as you know, uh, transplant can add significant stress to individuals in all areas of their life, including financially. Uh, today, we hope to help relieve some of that stress um, by introducing the organizations out there to support you. Uh, my name is Anna Morgan Pilardi. I am the Program and Communications Director for the Chris Klug Foundation, or CKF, and I'll be introducing you to today's panelists and moderating this session. Uh, I would first like to thank our generous sponsors, Hearts for Rust Foundation, who helped make the series possible, and our partners today, National Foundation for Transplant, and each of our panelists for joining us. Uh, thank you to all of those who pre-submitted questions for today's sessions. Uh, if you have uh, further questions for today's panelists, please send them to info at chrisklugfoundation.org. And if you're interested in any other topics uh, we will be discussing during this year's series, uh, head to chrisklugfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. Now I would like to introduce today's panelists and give them a moment to introduce themselves and their organizations. First, I would like to introduce Rick Lofgren, the president and CEO of Children's Organ Transplant Association, or CODA. Uh, Rick, if you give us a little introduction to yourself and your team. Terrific. Thank you, Anna. Um, my name again is Rick Lofgren. I'm the president of CODA, and I've had the pleasure of serving in this role for 25 years. And just like families throughout the country that are facing a transplant diagnosis, our families that work with the Children's Organ Transplant Association, or CODA, are typically in the midst of the fight for their lives. Their friends and family encircle them, both literally and figuratively, during a life-saving transplant journey, and it's what we refer to as the CODA community. It's a community that was established nearly four decades ago in central Indiana by one family who turned to their local community because their toddler son needed a life-saving liver transplant that they simply could not afford. At CODA, we have a unique understanding about the burden and fear that accompanies the shocking words that our parents and our loved ones hear, your child needs a life-saving transplant to survive. CODA provides relief by shifting the responsibility of fundraising for transplant-related expenses to a team of volunteers who our staff members train and coach. And this allows CODA families to let go of many of their financial fears. And as a 501c3 charity, all the contributions to CODA are tax-deductible to the fullest extent allowed by law, and funds are available for a lifetime of transplant-related expenses. Transplant families who choose to work with us, ask we ask them to identify volunteers who can lead the fundraising effort. And then our team then gets to work training these volunteers with written materials and fundraising pieces, either virtually or in person. And each CODA community campaign also receives at no charge a fundraising website that the volunteers personalize and can share within their community of support. Volunteers really are critical to the CODA community as they are the lifeline for CODA families. One of the things that happened during the pandemic is that we stopped getting into hospitals and started working more with partners like the Chris Klug Foundation to get our information out in front of families that need our help. Families that we work with across the country credit much of their success for the CODA campaign to our nonprofit charity status, which allows families, friends, and associates to make tax-deductible contributions. CODA is also able to help families at no cost to them themselves or their volunteers and we also provide grants to assist with transplant costs, which are hallmarks of our work since we were founded in 1986. And today, more than $160 million has been given to assist thousands of transplant families grappling with the many stressors of needing a life-saving organ or tissue transplant. Our service and guidance are provided at no charge to transplant families, and 100% of each contribution made to CODA in honor of our patients actually helps to meet transplant-related costs. For nearly 25 years, I've been involved in countless conversations with the CODA family members, including one earlier today, and I've heard repeatedly if we had not been there to step into the gap, the family would have been financially devastated. Each part of our CODA community members understand that transplant-related expenses do not end once a transplant is received, and transplant families need that long-term network of support and the avenue of hope that CODA provides. Thank you, Rick, and thank you for all of your hard work. Um, it's truly inspiring to see how many uh, support networks are out there for those going through transplant. Uh, next up, we have Sunny, uh, Sunny Mullen, the Director of Outreach for Help Hope Live. Uh, Sunny, can you introduce yourself and the foundation? Sure. Thank you so much, Anna. And thank you for having us here today on this panel of our partners that we work with uh, day in and day out. And so, as Anna said, my name is Sunny Mullen. I am the Director of Outreach with Help Hope Live. 
And we are a national nonprofit that services individuals of all ages to go into their communities to fundraise toward their medical expenses and related costs. We assist individuals needing life-saving organ transplants and those living with catastrophic injuries, catastrophic illnesses to activate their communities to put on fundraisers. And then the funds come back to Help Hope Live and are Help Hope Live assets. So they should not affect the individual's asset-based benefits or become taxable income to the family. And then they submit their bills to us and we help pay those bills directly. So we are here for their lifetime to continuously help them fundraise and give them the support and allow their communities to hold them up in their journeys that they need to continue to live their lives as fully as possible, whatever that looks like to them. Um, and we are very proud that this year is our 40th anniversary. So kind of in the same way Rick said CODA was founded, we were also founded by, we were founded by an organ uh, heart transplant surgeon who was in the community, knew that this was such a need in the early 80s here at Temple University out in Philadelphia, uh, Dr. Jack Kolf. And we really honor him and his legacy with everything we do day in and day out. And so we are here to help the community as much as possible, administer the funds and figure out what types of fundraisers work best in their community and really try to give them the hope they need to continue on their journey. So I appreciate you having us here today and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Sunny. Um, thank you for all of your hard work and happy 40th anniversary. Uh, next, we have Lauren Fusco, the Director of Client Services for the National Foundation of Transplants. Thank you, Anna, for the introduction and for getting this panel together. My name is Lauren Fusco. I am the Director of Client Services at the National Foundation for Transplants, or more simply known as NFT. Um, NFT has also been working for the past 40 years of supporting individuals through their transplant journeys. Similar starting stories to the other two organizations as well. The Memphis community did see a need for one of their members in the transplant journey. They came together and that opened up a variety of different doors of different people who also needed supports in their financial journeys through their transplant. Our goal at NFT is to empower community, foster health equity, and to improve or regain quality of life for people going through the organ transplant process or for those who are don donating their organs as living donors. We want to help eliminate any financial barriers that arise before, during, or after the person's transplant process by encouraging fundraising efforts and providing financial grant opportunities to those in need with the goal of ultimately contributing to the saving of lives. Our hope is to continue partnering with organizations like the Chris Kluke organization or the, our other panel members. So that way we can continue supporting those in the transplant process. Thank you. And thank you for your work as well. I think it's always so amazing how a community can come together um, for one person. And that's really what transplant is about. It takes a village to raise a child. It takes a village to have a transplant. Um, so, and I would like to get started with the questions that everybody uh, sent in uh, ahead of this webinar. Um, and we're gonna throw them out there. Um, feel free to jump in on each other's answers if you have anything to add. Um, so Rick, let's start with you. What are the general costs a candidate may be looking at in terms of a transplant and the required care um, that they will need? And how much is the average transplant? Are they expected to cover those costs up front? How does that work? That's a great question that most families entering this process don't have a good grasp of. The common transplant costs that we work with include prescriptions, co-payments and deductibles, transportation and lodging, lab draws, clinic visits, those kind of things that most people would say that makes perfect sense when you go to a hospital or transplant center. But one of the biggest costs that we see are what we refer to as household expenses. So those things that every family has, whether they need a transplant or not, those are eligible expenses for us to help with while a patient is at the transplant center, either pre, pre-transplant, during the transplant itself, or post-transplant for follow-up care. And for most of our families that have high deductible plans that might require three to $5,000 of annual out-of-pocket expenses, even after the transplant, it, it truly is a lifetime of expenses. The average kidney transplant has billings of in excess of $450,000, and unfortunately, that's the least expensive of any of the transplants, with some multiple 
transplant costs over a million and a half dollars, like a heart and a lung transplant. So many of our families are now being asked by the transplant team that they're working with to demonstrate that they have funds on hand to pay for expenses like prescriptions and lodging during the transplant. Fundraising not only can help with these costs, but provide for many years of costs that every transplant patient in their family will incur. I always like to tell a story about a young man who had his transplant 30 years ago at age two, and now at 32, Ben Sorensen is still submitting receipts for his medication costs. And so that's what we hope for every one of our families is their outcome is not only does their patient live a long and healthy life, but the money is there to help them with those out-of-pocket costs that might be tomorrow. They might also be 30 years from now like Ben has had. Thank you. Yeah, my uh, brother-in-law uh, was placed on the heart transplant wait list. I remember when they told us, you know, you're looking at a million for him to have his transplant. Everybody sort of just shut down and we're like, what? That's not even a feasible number amount. Um, so thank you for organizations like all of yours. It definitely helps. I think that's part of why individuals find organizations like ours, because unfortunately they are being told when they go to the hospitals, like Rick said, that they need to have a certain amount of money on hand. And that's a hard conversation and a really important conversation that is really kind of creating a, a disparate group of individuals that even can go through the transplant process. Who can actually afford to have a transplant? Should it be something you should have to be able to afford? And it, it does come into some moral conversations. And that's why individuals are coming to our organizations a lot of times in the first place, because they're being told they have to fundraise to even get listed, which is, is so hard to even just have that conversation. Really. Which leads me right into my next question. Uh, Lauren, what happens if an individual cannot cover the funds for a transplant? Are they removed from the wait list? Is there a way that they can avoid this? What options do they have to cover those funds? That's a great question and a great segue, Sunny. Um, in the sense that <laughs> right? when a patient is first identified as needing a transfer a transplant, they'll start hearing about that elusive wait list and what does that mean and the evaluation that's associated with it. And when that happens, what that means is that the medical team is kind of giving out points. It's a point system based on a variety of different things. And those factors determine their eligibility to be added to that wait list your priority level on that wait list or the ability to remain on the wait list if they were previously added. One of those evaluated sections and one of the highest ones is that of financial stability. This means that when a patient may have or a patient may have to guarantee a certain amount of funds to confirm that they're able to cover all of the anticipated costs associated with their transplant that their insurance will not cover and that's if they have insurance. Um, this can include ongoing medical need, medication needs, a portion of the transplant procedure or additional procedures that may be needed, the ability to pay insurance premiums or to obtain adequate shelter, utilities, nutrition, medical devices, a whole slew of things. Um, so if financial situations change or it's determined that a patient's not able to cover those costs associated with transplant prep, the transplant procedure or ongoing care post-transplant, they can be removed from the transplant wait list or could still remain on it. But since the wait list is not on a first come first serve basis, um, but instead based on that points from that eligibility list, those who are not able to provide that financial stability or confirmation may never make it to the top of that list to receive a transplant. So in order to combat this, organizations like NFT or CODA or Help Hope Lives um, encourages patients to work with us to fundraise campaigns alongside NFT and, and apply for NFT provided grant opportunities based on those identified needs. So we can work with the patient to confirm that the fund requirements are met for that transplant. An additional benefit of fundraising and applying for grants with NFT opposed to independently is that we can also guarantee to those medical professionals that not only one, there are available funds, but two, that they're solely going to be utilized for the costs identified that will put that patient in the most successful situation to thrive with their new tra transplant. And you definitely touched on an important part there. Not everybody that's going through this has insurance. And that's a very scary moment where you don't have it and your life is already tipped upside down. And if you do have insurance, it's still very expensive, but facing it without, um, organizations such as um, all of the three here are so critical in, in supporting you through that process. Um, so Sunny, after their transplant, 
Uh, what can patients expect in terms of expenses? Can they uh, receive ongoing support from organizations? So I would even say the two biggest expenses we tend to see even pre-transplant and post-transplant, I would say pre-transplant is dental work. Something that people might not always think of is that your mouth health is very important to your transplant. And so a lot of our clients end up having to have full dental rehaul before their transplants. And so that's a really big expense that we see a lot before transplant. Post-transplant is also the fact that usually when you are getting your transplant, you then need to stay within that city, within that hospital perimeter for at least 30 days. So you, your loved ones, a lot of times hospitals will have guest houses, will have transplant houses associated with them that are great, that are very low cost, possibly even at no cost. But sometimes you do need to stay in a hotel or rent an apartment. Um, then you're going back and forth to the hospital almost every day for testing. And, uh, you know, the parking adds up. All of those little, I hate to say little because, like I say, they do add up. But things you might not actually think of right away. Parking, even the medical mileage rate, the going to and from, or even just, you know, a per diem rate to help you pay for your lunch each day. Those are the things that are guaranteed. You are guaranteed to stay 30 days at the very least to make sure that your organ is healing properly and that you are healing properly. Beyond that, I believe, yes, our organizations, as Rick just said, they've had a, a child 30 years still, still uh, submitting receipts. We are with our clients for their lifetime. We, in very much the same way, we just celebrated one of our transplant clients. He has been a client of Help Help Live for 20 years, and he is still has expenses related to his transplants every month. Um, so we are here for the long haul for all of our clients to be sure that we are helping them live that life and to honor their donor and their donor's families by living the healthiest life possible for with their organ. I think often everybody thinks of uh, transplant being this magic, click my fingers and I was fixed. And it's not, no, it doesn't look like that for most people. There's a lot of aftercare, there's a lot of treatment uh, post and for the whole family, you know, it's a whole family going through that experience. And I will say, at least in our instance, and I always say, cause people, when I'm, doing presentations to different medical centers. And they say, well, what's the general, how long are people your clients? And especially because we serve individuals with transplant and injury and illness that, you know, best case scenario with transplant, they might be our client for three to five years in and out. That's fantastic. That is the best case. But like I said, we do have transplant clients that have been with us for 20 years that are with us for their lifetime. So that's definitely something that, like, like you're saying, they don't necessarily think about the lifetime of, of expenses. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, next up. Uh, Lauren, what should individuals be aware of when looking to fundraise for their transplant? What are the top questions that may, they maybe need to ask organizations when getting involved? How does that process work? Sure. So I was able to come up with three big questions. There's going to be a million, right? And you should never be hesitate to ask those questions to organizations that you're looking to partner or, or work with. Um, but the three big ones that came to mind was, what would your team look like when you become a participant of that organization and what tools are available to you? So for example, at NFT, you'll be assigned a full team of support. So that consists of an intake coordinator to walk you through your application and support you with obtaining the needed documentation. A patient advocate will help explain what grants you may be eligible for, how the payment process works, and to, to help navigate questions about the transplant process or to lend a listening ear. Sometimes that's the most important part. Um, this would also be your go-to person if there were ever a documented change in care from your medical team, which would indicate that your grant needs to change or your financial need changes or needs to be updated, switched, or increased. Um, and then we also provide fundraising consultants who will review your financial documents with you, help you identify your fundraising goals on behalf of NFT, and set up, uh, set up a fundraising website and come up with creative ideas specific to you and your community. We wanna be able to be there to problem solve, celebrate, and build a relationship with the patient and their families and their support system. The second question I would ask is, if that organization is a 501c3, 
there's many benefits to working with organizations like NFT that are 501c3s. Um, but a big one being is that receiving grants through us will not impact the benefits you are currently receiving. Um, we're also held to specific nonprofit guidelines, which means we can guarantee the appropriate use of money, like we mentioned earlier, raised through, through fundraising, specifically for your transplant, which is a big distinction to your medical team and to people who are donating to the organization on your behalf. And then speaking of donors, this is a big benefit to them as well. When you enlist your community to donate money to NFT or another 501c3, those donors are eligible for a tax refund based on their donation. If they donate to places that do not have that distinction, the money that's donated is, is considered a cash gift and will not be eligible for that tax refund. The last question I was coming up with that I thought was big too was how can you, how long can you be a member of the organization, which we had just touched on briefly as well. Can you continue to work with the organization to support others once you're no longer in that financial need? And same as the other two organizations at NFT, we have had patients who are active with us for over 20 years. So we hope to create that community beyond transplant by empowering patients to fundraise for the organization to support themselves and others in similar situations, and also provide opportunities to become an ambassador with NFT by mentoring other members who may be just starting their transplant journey or their fundraising situation, or just to continue to check in with us so we can hear your stories and celebrate your successes with you. I want to pass that out. Anyone else want to add on to maybe something that they think is important um, to ask when you're getting involved? I think one thing that I'm, I'm sure all of our organizations do that we always make sure to highlight is the fact that we also medically verify every client that we work with so that it is another safeguard and transparency for not only the recipient, the client themselves, but their entire community. So they, again, can be guaranteed that the funds are actually going for the right reasons for this individual actually has that condition. So I think, I mean, I know in my personal life, I read all the fine print. You know, you're always like, what is this platform you're using? What are the fees? What is like, ask the questions. What are the fees up front? What is there a platform fee? Is there a user fee? Is there any kind of all of it? Just continue to read the fine print because if you're going to have questions, your community is certainly going to have, have questions. And so you, you need to be prepared to have the right answers to that, that will make everyone in your community comfortable with supporting you. And Anna, if I could expand on something that both Sonny and Lauren touched on, a lot of the patients that come to us have already started a GoFundMe account when they reach out to us. Mm -hmm. And I have to say with what's the best question to ask specifically with working with one of our organizations, is that tax deductibility issue that Sonny just touched on. It's not just for the donor that gets the tax deduction, but it's for the recipient. And if that money is coming directly into a parent's bank account or the spouse of the patient's bank account, that's taxable income. And we've had a lot of families that have not realized that and been disqualified for their benefits or perhaps start paying a premium for their, their Medicare or Medicaid benefit. And so we really want families to know that as a nonprofit, each of our organizations is not only non-taxable for them when they receive the benefits, but for the donors, there's also that tax deduction. And no one gives just because of tax deduction, but it makes it a lot easier for donors to give a little bit more and feel good about sharing that information with others, knowing that there is that safe, that safeguard and accountability that Sunny just mentioned. There's a lot more depth to this process, and when you're in the midst of being told your loved one's not going to make it without a transplant. Those are some of the details that you really just can't get your arms around very well. So asking that kind of question, and maybe that's where a family member or a friend can help come alongside them and help them through that process and help make that decision. What's the best outcome for me? I would say in 99 out of 100 cases, it's going to be one of our three organizations rather than a GoFundMe or a GoFundMe-like entity. I would also add to that the fact that because we're all nonprofits, they can also, we can accept on their behalf corporate gifts. So something that as an individual, you can't accept. So we allow individuals to expand on their fundraising efforts by working with one of our organizations. It's definitely important. And you guys, I mean, you're all the specialists. You work with transplant recipients specifically, and that's such a different experience to any other um, care um, platform and GoFundMe raises money for everybody, whereas this is looking at specific transplant care. Um, 
So yeah, and definitely I agree with everyone. Ask the questions. Don't ever be afraid to ask a question because it's never, you know, not needed. Um, so Rick, I'm going to keep it with you. What about the costs of receiving an organ from a living donor? Is that the recipient's responsibility? How can organizations help them support? Uh, that's that's a great question, Anna. Many of our CODA patients receive a kidney or a partial liver transplant from a family member or a friend. One of our CODA parents recently was part of what's called a domino transplant, and the mom donated a kidney to a non-related patient because no one in their family was a match to her son. And then her son then essentially got in line that later on when another patient has a matched donor but not matched to that patient, her son, Evan, will receive the benefit of that kidney. And that was part of a, a domino chain that resulted in more than uh, 10 people being transplanted. There are still a couple people, including our patient, that are still in line but waiting for that to happen. But all of those costs are things that we can pay for for both the recipient and the donor. And in most cases, the donor's insurance company will cover the vast majority of the costs. But obviously, there are additional costs, time off work for the donor. We can cover their household expenses as well. And there are a lot of other pieces that come to that that you think about someone who's healthy that's giving a donation and likely will be out of work for six to eight weeks following their transplant. They're giving up, I'm sure, a great deal of income and other costs that they would incur. But that's something that we can certainly help with. We also work with the National Living Donor Assistance Program to try to ensure those families that qualify for that, that funding, those donors also receive assistance from there. So whether someone's got private insurance, Medicare, or Medicaid, or, or using the the living donor program, we want to ensure that we're putting our families in the best position to be eligible for everything that, that is available, including some of the things that we do. In addition, our volunteer teams, as they raise money, each CODA patient and their volunteer team is eligible for what we call challenge grants. In our case, we offer up to $10,000 in challenge grants, which are provided in $2,500 increments for each $25,000 that a volunteer team raises. Right now, our average CODA campaign is raising a little more than 20000 so most of our patients do qualify for one of those challenge grants, but we also have state funds, we have a type of transplant funds, and we have disease-specific funds. So if any of your listeners have cystic fibrosis, each of our CODA families receives a grant from the CF fund. So there are a lot of benefits of working with organizations that not only help the transplant recipient, but also the, the, the living donor as well. I think the living don donation side of it is so important because often it is can make the difference. It definitely, you know, if you have that financial support for your donor um, or for a potential donor, it can encourage them to take the steps to um, become a donor. Um, yeah. So thank you, Rick. Okay. And I'm going to finish it off with Sunny. Um, whom uh, should patients contact to learn more about their financial options? Is there a specific individual at a hospital or transplant center that's trained to help them that you guys work closely with? How does that work? Every transplant center has a financial coordinator and a social worker that every patient should be assigned to, or if you aren't, make sure you are. There's going to be one probably on the floor that you're on right away, specific to even the organ. So those are your a number one supporters when you're in that transplant center. And they're the people that we are working with to verify those conditions, to get the referrals in, to be sure that we're getting the message out as much as possible to the, or to the individuals. So those are your number one supports. They have all of the resources. They are there to make sure that you're making sure that your wages are covered or what are you eligible for? How much benefits are you eligible for? So that finance, there's specifically a transplant financial coordinator is the position that, that you should be asking the question of. Um, and then beyond that, your social worker is there to support with everything else that you need on a day-to-day -day basis. And there is really nothing that those social workers can't get done. They are huge fighters on behalf of their patients and they are there to support. So yeah, that transplant financial coordinator, A number one, and then your social worker, they will become your new best friends for sure. Thank you. And I just want to pass the floor to everybody um, that sort of sums up all of our questions for today. But is there anything that you want to leave the listeners with you want them to specifically know about your organization and how you're there to help? Well, I always like to say that our organizations aren't fighting it out. We're not Coke and Pepsi where we're against each other. We really do complement each other. 
we tend to work more pro closely with pediatric cases, although we can help some adults. But whenever there's a patient that we can't work with for whatever reason, we always refer them to Help Hope Live and NFT. And we want to make sure that families have a resource to look at. And if it were my wife and I, we'd sit down with everyone's information at the kitchen table and make sure that we were making the best decision for our family and for our child. And I hope that all of your listeners are able to do the exact same thing. Make an informed decision that makes the most sense to your personal situation because we all have different circumstances and no one's transplant journey is the same. So we hope that everyone will take a look at each of our organizations and think critically about what's the best for, for my family. That was beautiful, Rick. And really, we always, we believe, and all of our organizations I know believe, that no medical crisis should turn into a financial crisis, which is why we were all founded, because there was a medical crisis that did turn into a financial crisis. And so we are here to help. And there is no shame in asking for that help. That is the number one thing. We know it's hard, but it if you can take that first step, there are people there willing to catch you. So please just make the ask. And along those same lines too, there's no such thing as a silly question. So if you're like, mm, no, I probably don't qualify based off the information yeah. that I read or what I've heard or somebody else's past experience, still call. We're happy to guide you either to each other's organizations, like Rick was saying, or internally to be able to walk you through that process and hold your hand all the way through. So that way we're able to get you the support you need, even if it's not from one of us. Thank you all. Definitely reach out. Um, if you want to be put in contact with any of the speakers here, please reach out to us at Chris Klug Foundation, or you can find their websites linked um, in the description of this video. Um, so that is it for today's session. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their expertise and their journeys um, and informing us all about what they do. Uh, so thank you for tuning in to today's session. We hope that you found it inspiring and informative. Again, if you have any questions for the panel or want to learn more about this year's webinar series, reach out to or head to chriskloopfoundation.org slash CKF webinar series. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy and live life, give life.